NumPy is an amazing piece of software and hardware, and it's been around for a really long time. And today we're going to talk about the BrewPy Remix and how you can build a fermentation controller easier than ever. With this new project, you can keep your fermentation temperatures dialed within a tenth of a degree. Lee Bussey, the creator of BrewPy Remix, talks to us today on Homebrewing DIY. Welcome back to Homebrewing DIY, the show that takes on the do-it-yourself aspect of homebrewing. Gadgets, contraptions, and parts, this show covers it all. On today's show, we're talking to Lee Bussey about the BrewPie Remix. BrewPie Remix is a fermentation chamber controller based on the Raspberry Pi and Arduino Uno. Lee has forked the legacy branch of the BrewPie project and added more features. I'm very excited to see what changes he's made and what's new in the project. Please support the podcast by clicking on the support link in the description or going to anchor.fm forward slash homebrewing DIY forward slash support. Your support helps keep this show on the air and it will also help this show improve. If you can't give monthly, please give us a review on Apple Podcasts. Your review will help other listeners find this show. The last way you can support the podcast is by trying Brewfather. Brewfather is the homebrewing software that I personally use. I've tried them all, and Brewfather is by far the easiest to use and looks great too. Did you know that you can do water adjustments in Brewfather? It's very easy. You put your base water profile in and add your target, and then it will calculate the amounts of salts that you need to add. Brewfather makes doing your recipes and water adjustments a snap. The best part is that they have a free version so that you can try to see if it's a good fit for you. Head on over to the show's website at homebrewingdiy.beer and click on the Brewfather banner to get started for free. Once again, our website is homebrewingdiy.beer and click on the Brewfather link. Any feedback is appreciated, and if you want to ask a question or just tell us how we're doing, send your feedback to podcast at homebrewingdiy.beer. That's podcast at homebrewingdiy.beer. Now let's get into our discussion with Lee Bussey and talk to him about the Brew Pie Remix. I'd like to welcome to the show Lee Bussey. He's the founder of Brew Pie Remix, which is an offshoot or a fork off of the original Brew Pie project. I'd like to welcome him to the show. Hi, Lee. Are hey, you Coulter, there? Thanks very much. I am. Thanks very much for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you on the show. Um, I, I think where we should get started is let's just kind of talk about the history of Brew Pie. Let's assume I've never even heard of Brew Pie. Let's start with what it is and how it was founded and then hop into kind of how you ended up doing your own project with it. Sure thing. Well, um, the originator was uh, Uber Fridge, uh, Brew Pie's predecessor. It was created by a Dutch home brewer named Elko Jacobs. Uh, at the time, he was an electrical engineering student. Uh, the first Google Code project popped up November 12, 2011. And uh, in the end of November, uh, the Uber Fridge website came live. He created it using the Arduino Nano, which was the predecessor of the Uno. And uh, the web server he actually had running on an old router he had laying around running DDWRT, which is a, a, an open source firmware for the users. Um, you know, it's a, it's a PID controller, proportional, in- integral, and derivative. And that's sort of analogous to controlling the speed in a car, if you can picture going up a hill, uh, it gradually lets your foot off the gas as you come to the top. You know, you're, you're, you're coasting a little bit. And then going down, you're going to let the car accelerate to keep the same speed. So that controller for temperature does the same thing. It reads the temperatures. It adjusts to the way the uh, chamber reacts. And then it controls them accordingly. So uh, after uh, Uber Fridge, uh, he decided to move on to the new thing, which was Arduino. Uh, and then the uh, first firmware for that, uh, the Arduino Uno, version one, 
was September 27, 2012. And shortly thereafter, there was an article in Hack Day, which uh, really kicked it off for him, uh, followed by another article in Wire. Uh, he decided at that point to give up on the router running the website. It was more novelty than anything else and started using the Raspberry Pi, which is a uh, called a SOC, or System on a Chip computer. It's a fairly low entry price computer for folks. It is Unix-based, but it's got a nice front end, and it's, it's friendly. It's a friendly Unix-based computer, or, or server in this case, for the project. Elko uh, decided to discontinue the Arduino version, or the Arduino Uno version of BrewPi, because he said he was uh, spending more time optimizing for code size because that Uno is only 32K. Um, and if you picture a 32K memory, the uh, BM5150 was released in 1981 with 64K. So 32K is not very much. Um, he spent uh, a lot of time optimizing. It wasn't powerful enough for the growth that he really wanted to add to the project. Um, so the last commit was in 2015. Uh, you know, in, in conversations online with Elko, he always points out, and, and I think I need to say this to be fair to him, that he was not proud of the design. Uh, as he learned more about development and, and developing these applications, he found out that he wished he would have done things differently. So they moved on to BrewBlox on the Spark platform, uh, and that is something he says he's really proud of, so that all the new hotness, the new commercial uh, yet still open source products are on that uh, brew box. It's a complete brewery uh, control, um, but with the brew pie, uh, I think people are really drawn to it, especially on the Arduino Uno, because it has a low cost of entry. Um, it does one thing extremely well, and that is control the temperature of your beer within a plus or minus a tenth of a degree, uh, and it's not that hard to get running. I would agree with that. I my my first setup was an original brew tr brew pie on the Arduino. I think that with your Raspberry Pi fully, the full cost of that was about fifty sixty bucks. So it was a very very inexpensive cost of entry, and simple in you could just get on the internet and follow instructions and be online, and you could be up and running pretty easily. Uh, you could, and uh, those instructions, you know, they they were spread all over the internet, and I think that's part of the challenge that, that people have, if any, of getting started, is trying to find the right bit of information. So as you know, Homebrew Talk has got a what we call mega thread. Uh, I, I don't know how many posts, I think it's in the 7,000s now, uh, just talking about this one very simple product. Yes, uh, that, that particular thread, I th don't even think will take new comments on it, it's so big. It, it's it, it, it's been around for so long uh so i i would say let, let's now get into why you decided to fork that project and move over and create brew pie remix yeah so yeah you know, i want to really emphasize that it is a fork um i did not take over brew pie elko still owns the website uh, owns the original github repository i created a new repository which was a copy of his original work of the legacy branch, legacy branch being that which provided the Arduino Uno code. Um, just before Christmas, a friend of mine killed his brew pie setup. Folks that have experience with Raspberry Pi know that those little SD cards have a bad habit of going bad. Um, there was a rather convoluted process a person had to go through to install the newer brew pie versions and then revert back to legacy in order to be able to support the arduino uno um, but we found out that even that wasn't available because of changes to some of the core libraries that it uses uh, like php so um, a couple of beers and bourbons later i thought you know i can fix this um, and one thing led to another. So uh, before I knew it, I've got uh, over a thousand commits, 903 changed files, and decided that you know rebranding that as Brew Pie Remix with Elko's blessing, by the way, uh, was the way to go. It's uh, I wanted to make sure that my friend could install it when he had to next, instead of having to call me over there. Now I don't mind going over and drinking his beer. 
or his bourbon. But uh, he, he needs to be able to install that himself. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And you you even have a, a website that has all of the instructions uh, and and a place for people to be able to go and kind of find their way around if I wanted to just kind of get started with Brew Pie Remix. What, what kind of big changes have you made to the Brew Pie software that's different from when it was kind of abandoned into the legacy branch? Well, I started with the tool set. Uh, it's, it's split up into several parts. So there's the firmware that runs on the Arduino. There is the website that actually is that, that user interface. There's the scripts that do the communication back and forth with the Arduino. And then there's the tools. And the tools are what handle the installation, uh, changing permissions, just in general, making sure everything is uh, running well. So that was my initial effort. Um, so the one thing I want to do, and, and my friend uh, John Beeler Thorak on Homebrew Talk says that uh, if somebody has a problem, that's a bug. And that's something I really took to heart. So I wanted a one-line install. Somebody can cut and paste a single command onto the command line in a terminal window, and it will install. So that's the biggest feature there. Uh, no running multiple scripts. You run this. And by the time it's done, after asking you a couple of simple questions, it's running. You can go to the web page, and you have this wonderful, very familiar now, classic, Rupai looking web page. Um, in addition, since I can't leave well enough alone, um, uh, my current job right now, I've got a very large focus on security. So on the back end, um, I, I tuned some things a little bit to make sure that the average person wasn't making mistakes that could leave themselves open to hacking. Uh, there are some very bad actors out there, and they can do things that would curl your toes. So I want to make sure that the system itself is a little bit better protected. It's not hardened. It's not ready to be on the Internet, if you will, but it's definitely better than it was. Um, it now runs in a daemon mode, which is uh, like a service, instead of the old cron tab entries that were problems, were troublesome. Uh, and then the script starts faster. Generally, people would sit there hammering away on the start script button uh, until it finally took off. Uh, now it starts in seconds. Um, I've added multi-chamber support, which is one of the biggest hacks out there that people used to look for, wanting to run or control more than one refrigerator with one Rupai setup. So now I've got a, a menu page where you can view all of your chambers at once and then drill down into each one and uh, control it like normal. Um, added support for the ESP8266, which is a very small controller that features prominently in the Fermentrack product. Um, the Fermentrack was based on BrewPi, so that was a pretty easy lift to bring that in there. So now people can use that controller if that's really what they want to do and use that with uh, the very comfortable, soothing BrewPi interface. Uh, I've added in support for Wi-Fi native controllers, which builds upon the uh, Bluetooth control that uh, folks have used in the past. Um, something that just came out in one of the last feature releases was tilt support. Love the tilt hydrometer. Uh, those guys have done a fantastic job with the tilt. And being able to see that on the screen as you're going through your fermentation is awesome. Um, and then in the last feature release, I added support for what's called an I2C LCD. So the, the standard LCD that was always part of the project had this big 20-pin cable or 16-pin cable, I guess it was, um, sort of like the old computer hard drive cables. I2C only uses four pins, which freed up some pins for doing some other things. So that's a little bit easier. And it was also important because it removed the necessity to have a shield. There was supporting circuitry required for the Arduino in order to be able to control the LCD previously. Now that's not required. Uh, although we did create a new shield, uh, Caddy Brewer on Homebrew Talk assisted me uh, with getting a new shield together says so it's very full featured it works with either of those two lcd choices but importantly a person can put together an arduino uno running group i remix with an lcd without ever picking up a soldering iron so i think that was one of the biggest things that came in that last feature release 
I, I have to admit, being able to set up a brew pie without having to pick up a soldering iron is a really big leap in the right direction in making it available for more people. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, you know, when I started out with this, I, I maybe used a soldering iron twice before in my life. Um, you know, the day tripper on the homebrew talk threads, and he's an electrical engineer, and what he says is simple. I simply did this. I always shake my head. Sometimes I don't even know what he's talking about. So, you know, with his help over the years, I've certainly come along. But, uh, you know, to be able to just plug things together with a few DuPont jumpers, uh, really much easier, much quicker, and work a lot easier on the bench as I change things around. Yeah, especially if you're trying to add different features like, hey, maybe I want to see if an LCD will work, but it's not necessarily necessary to run it. And so just being able to do so with DuPonts and and just kind of breadboarding it out and having it run easily is, is kind of really attractive to, I think, somebody who's brand new to any of this, right? Um, yeah, I think so. All the other products, um, even uh, the Furman Track, and, and John has done a fantastic job with Furman Track with the front end. It's, it's quite modernized and everything. But there is a cost of entry in that you must do some soldering, at the very least, to put the pins on that ESP board. They don't come soldered on. Uh, Arduino Uno has always been very friendly to uh, tinkerers in that case. Absolutely. Absolutely. And my, my, I, I would say when it comes to other new features, like, for example, adding the tilt hydrometer, what what changes does that add to the software so like right now it's going to track for example without the tilt hydrometer that's going to track obviously my heating and cooling and what what my current temperature is of my beer does that actually add an additional line to the software where you're able to see what the gravity looks like yeah it shows up right on the original screen where you see your temperature graph uh, you can see the specific gravity over time so you see this you know nice curve dropping off so you get an idea of when you're ready to change temperatures or when your beer or wine is just done fermenting and you can uh, rack or move on to the next step um, well I don't take any action on the specific gravity right now um, you know, group ILS has a means to create a profile a temperature profile based on the gravity um, getting that information into brew pie was really the heavy lift. Now that it's there, uh, the next feature of these, hopefully, is on my list of things to do where I can put in a gravity-based temperature profile instead of just a time-based one. Wow, that would be a really cool feature. Uh, really looking forward to having something like that and the ability to do that in the future. What, what would you say is the cost of entry right now if I were to say... I don't even have a Raspberry Pi. I need to buy all the things to, to acquire to to build this. What, what would you say is the cost of entry and what kind of parts do I need to get set up with BrewPi Remix? Well, like you mentioned, you need a Raspberry Pi, but uh, even that's not necessary. Uh, people can run uh, any old PC they have laying around most easily running a, a Debian, uh, one of those um, Debian uh, forks. Um, you can even take an image of Raspbian created for the Intel processor, meaning you can run Raspbian on an old PC just to make everything the same. Uh, that said, in the past, some folks have had some success running it even on a Windows machine, but I sincerely do not recommend it. Um, you can buy a Raspberry Pi Zero W, W for wireless, for about $22, brand new right now. $22 for a computer is ridiculously cheap. Um, so to have something that you can just tuck off to the side and not worry about if your kids are playing games or what have you, um, that's quite a bit of uh, peace of mind. Um, you know, the Unos, you can get any $3 if you check on the, the Chinese websites, uh, up to $15. I'd looked on Amazon before we had this conversation. So all told, the most expensive way to go, having to buy everything brand new you have nothing laying around. You are completely new to this. Buying everything on Amazon because you want two-day delivery. I picked all prime items. It's $126, not including the fridge uh, or a box to put it in. That's kind of on the high side. Um, 
but if you have an Uno laying around, if you've got a computer laying around, a couple of these other parts, uh, folks have been able to do this for as low as, as $20, $30, um, getting everything from China. I got the price this morning as I was looking through there down to about $40 with some careful shopping and figuring uh, that I was going to build two or three of them because a lot of those parts like the resistors come in, you know, big bulk packs. Uh, you can't just buy one. Yeah, they come in big bulk packs and they cost about a penny <laughs> when you actually look at the right. cost of an individual resistor. And even the temp probes that, that are used in it, th- you can buy the whole set for less than $10. You can, and you find that the more that you play with these things, you just start having this stuff flying around. I probably have uh, 50 temp probes within reach right now, so they, they just sort of grow and, and multiply. Yeah, I have the same problem. I, I actually have all of the stuff laying around my house to build probably three or four uh, for Mentrack or ESP8266 type controllers. I I've, I've definitely understand what it's like to acquire things like that. Uh and then if I were brand new to doing something like this and had obviously never soldered before, what are com- some of the common issues that people run into? Um, you know, the most common issue right now is not knowing that there is this new script. Uh, we talked about that homebrew talk thread. If somebody starts at the beginning right there, they're going to go off to the, uh, the fandom wiki site um, they're going to get some instructions that were part of the old instructions. Uh, searching the Internet, you're going to find all sorts of things. And what I really distilled it down to is a single command. So if people start with that single command, if they go to brewpyremix.com and just look at the very simple instructions there, that takes care of probably 90% of the, the classic historical problems people have always had within that thread. Um, it, it's kind of... You know, I like that that churn, people talking all the time about it because it keeps people interested, keeps that thread up to the top of the list, you know, where, where people are always discussing it. So having simplified this, it's sort of had a, a negative effect, if you will, because there's less discussion. People run it, and it just works. So going back to, you know, Thorax comment, anything that goes sideways is a bug. Um, I think I've, I've really nailed it on that one in a lot of ways. Um, but it's had unintended side effects, unintended consequences. Uh, aside from that, um, you know, those UNOs are, are prone to uh, corrupt EEPROM. Uh, there's a button that clears that, so uh, they're, you know, sort of a canned answers. People say something on the, on the forum, and somebody immediately comes back and says, do this, you know, so that's one of the most common things. And then just functionally, um, not, not starting with a clean install, uh, Raspberry Pi, you know, as you're playing with it, doing the things, you're installing all these packages, there are some conflicts that can be created. Uh, you can install uh, Nginx web server for one product uh, where this product uses the classic Apache, um, and those two conflict with each other because they're both trying to listen on the same port. But if you start with a clean card, uh, I yet to find somebody who has followed the instructions on a clean card and not been able to have it up and running in you know, less than eight minutes. Uh, other than that, just get it running in the refrigerator. Use a fan, a little fan, one of those personal desk fans in the refrigerator makes a huge difference in the ability to keep that temperature uh, pretty constant. And then uh, not using a thermal well is another thing I see. Uh, some folks have had very good luck putting that probe on the outside of a fermenter. They insulate it with a piece of foam or what have you and strap it on really good. But when I see inconsistency, you know, uh, my temperature's swinging around, what's going on, if I can get them to just use a thermo well as sort of a least common denominator, that seems to take care of a bunch of problems. Other than that, it's been gravy. Yeah, the, the thermo well was actually an issue for me when I first started. I, I built mine back in 2014, and I tried trapping it to the side, and my temperatures swung all over the place. It was $12 from Brewer's Hardware, got a thermo well, put it through the top of a carboy, and it was amazing the difference. It, then it was dialed to that point one degree or that tenth of a single degree, and after that it was flawless. Yeah, and I do love that thermo well from, from those folks. Uh, Brewer's Hardware, great people. They had one of the best ones out there. It's spun closed on the bottom, and what that means is it's a very smooth uh, seam. You can't see a seam on it. Uh, you can get some for about $4 on Amazon now that are just crimped at the bottom. 
Uh, when I look at those, I see opportunities for germ to grow. So I, t- I tend to stay away from those. But if you were very careful, if you boiled them or what have you, you know, they might work out fine as well. Yeah, but the the Brewer's hardware, yes, it has no has no seams on it. And the other thing is, is that it, it, the difference in price between four dollars and twelve dollars, you're just getting a much higher quality of Thermowell. And it's also flared at the top in a way that makes it so that it, it just slaps right down. It, and, and we're talking easy, like the orange carboy cap can be what you use and not having to like drill through a, a bung or anything like that with those. It, it, they just work really well. Yep, that's exactly my setup. Is the orange carboy cap? Yep. That, that's awesome. I, I've moved to a fur monster and just drilled a hole through the top of my cap so that's that's actually my my bung hole actually holds my thermo well and the hole i drilled in the top of my cap and then added a gasket is where i put my my airlock so that that's at least what my setup looks like uh, i've got a few for monsters here as well i've been playing with the uh, the ice spindle and, and yes i will include support for that coming up uh, but as you know those things are huge compared to the tilt so that necessitated buying a few new fermenters to play with yeah, they they are much larger. When when you look at the tilt hydrometer, it, it's about half the size in width, is compared to the eye spindle. And then the other thing is is that uh, it's also not as long. It's 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 a lot more compact. Right. Yeah. And then, are you working on any new projects that have to do with home brewing? I am. I'm a bit of a serial hobbyist. Anytime something comes up, uh, well, that ADD takes hold, and I kind of go off in that direction. So uh, recently had another uh, home brewer and I, we had a conversation about an idea, uh, and what we came up with is a, a product or a project which allows what I'm calling non-connected brewers, those people who may not be uh, running temperature control or crazy logging or having very expensive instrumentation, but they just want to collect data about their beer and their wine fermentation. Um, so this new project is passive. Um, people are happy. A lot of people are happy with no temp control, but they can also add these features to existing setups like the fermenter for the brew pie. Um, so it's going to track uh, fermentation start finish relative fermentation rate. Uh, and also allow you to track ambient and uh, the vessel temperature if you don't have some other way to track that. Uh, it includes a mobile responsive web page. It can upload to the cloud, whether that's one of the brewing related websites or something like UbaDots. Um, and uh, of course, it'll be integrated out of the box with BrewPy as soon as I get that done. Um, and inexpensive, most of all. So, you know, tilt at $130. As far as I'm concerned, I have several of them, uh, but it's still $130, and some folks rather spend that on supplies. Uh, Play Doh, $130. It does some of these same things. Um, this project, depending on crafty shopping, buying from China, building more than one at the same time, uh, you can probably be all in for under $20 and have something that's going to give you a lot more information than what you have right now. That's really exciting. I, I can tell you that, like, for example, the guy who lives across the street from me is an avid home brewer, and he doesn't have temp control. And it, he has a really cold spot in his basement. He makes great beer. He doesn't, it do, the, the temperatures in his mind don't swing a lot, and he seems to do just fine, right? So for him to go out and build a big fermentation chamber is not really in his future. But he definitely wants things like like a tilt or some sort of thing to watch his fermentation because I I think that even the passive hoe brewer, including me, when you're fermenting, you're always looking at it, right? You go out and look at the bubbles, mm-hmm. you're looking at the, the the yeast churning. Well, to have some data to back that up is still gonna help you make better beer. Just knowing when your fermentation's done is gonna help you make better beer. Exactly, yeah. There, there's a lot of information that can be had just by watching, or in this case, electronically watching. Yes, exactly. Uh, I mean, for me, the I, th- I felt like the, the tilt or the eye spindle, for me, were like game changers, just in the fact that I could always tell when my fermentation was done. And being able to know that it was done without having to open the vessel and take a reading and go back two days later and take another reading, you just know. And it's great. Yep. 
Yep. Yep, they are fantastic products. They really are. Uh, any any other kind of improvements for your for your brewery? What what kind of beers are you brewing? What what are you up to? <laughs> Uh, you know, I don't brew as much as I used to. I, I started brewing in, in 91, and I, uh, I have this terrible habit of going to the most extreme degree. So in, you know, in the early 90s, I was doing all grain, which was kind of crazy at the time, and I was propagating yeast, and I became a, a, a homebrew uh, certification program. Uh, what is it? Uh, HBCH. I can't remember what they call it these days. It's changed a couple times, but I was a certified homebrew judge in the 90s. Um, so I, I certainly ebb and flow right now, kind of in the, uh, the ebb stage. Um, I have one thing in the fermenter right now, it's Skeeter pea. I, I make a big batch of that every year and this one is a little late, but, uh, fantastic to bring to cookouts. And I have one of those cookouts coming up. So that's what's going on right now. <laughs> I, you know, I've, I've homebrewed for about 10 years and I've never once made Skeeter pea. I, 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 obvi- and I obviously need to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I have a fail-safe method for it. I'll send it to you. I, I would love it. I'll actually, if if you send me your recipe for Skeeter Pea, I'll, I'll add it to the show notes so that people can uh, make it. Sounds good. Awesome. Um, the other thing I would say is, uh, why don't why don't you send me over the information anyone would need to build out a brew pie remix, and maybe even a small just kind of jotted down parts list so that I can uh, add that to the show notes. And if anybody would like to find them, just go right to our show notes. I'll add links to all of this so that you can see that. And uh, other than that, I, I would say, hey, Lee, thank you very much for coming on the show and discussing the Brew Pie Remix. This is a really cool project, and I'm really glad that you've done something supporting the Arduino because it really supports people like me. I still have an Arduino set up on my system just because it was working and all I did is change my, my, my web server. Right. And so the idea is that it's a fail safe way to work. And I've actually never even had an e-problem issue with mine. So it does work and they work well. Well, thanks for your time, Cole. Appreciate you letting me on. Hey, thank you very much. And thank you very much, Lee, and have a great day. You too. Once again, I want to thank Lee for taking the time to talk to me about the Brew Pie Remix. I also want to thank him for working on such a great free and open source project. If you want more information on Brew Pie Remix and any of Lee's other projects, why don't you head on over to brewpyremix.com. Once again, that's brewpyremix.com. Last, if you come over to our website, homebrewingdiy.beer, you can get the most detailed show notes and images of a finished brew pie setup. And also, I've uploaded Lee's recipe for Skeeter Pea. I already have plans to make some, and I hope you do too. You can download the recipe over at homebrewingdiy.beer. Well, that's the end of today's show, and thanks for listening to Homebrewing DIY. Homebrewing DIY.